Welcome to Osteobites, everybody. My name is Anne Graham. I'm an osteo warrior and executive director of MIB Agents. Today, we are talking with Paul Malley on planning for dignity and what matters most to you. Paul Malley is president of a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to help individuals and their families receive the care they want in case of a serious illness. Such an important topic. Uh, as president of Aging with Dignity, Paul coordinates the National Five Wishes Advanced Care Planning Program. This was created by Jim Toey, who is the founder of Aging with Dignity and former legal counsel to Mother Teresa of Calcutta, my personal hero, um, truly, five, and she's here with us over Paul's shoulder. Um, <laughs> five Wishes is an easy to use legal document that addresses important medical issues as well as personal, emotional, and spiritual matters at the end of life. Paul Malley and the work of Aging with Dignity have been featured in national media, including all of the major networks, their morning programs, as well as national newspapers. And of course, the highlight of all of it, they get to be on Osteobites <laughs> today. <laughs> Um, before we get started with this conversation that is so relevant to all of us, um, please know that MIB Agents supports patients and families through the entire osteosarcoma journey from diagnosis, treatment, relapse, hospice, bereavement, and survivorship. We focus on supporting the patient, family, and community through programs, research, and education. Osteosarcoma is a terrible beast of a disease, this we all know, but no one needs to do it alone. We have formed this community to offer hope, education, love, and support. If we can be helpful to you wherever you are in your osteosarcoma landscape, please just say the word. Also want to note that if you can help MIB agents in our mission to make it better, Giving Tuesday is coming up and we could of course use your help. We're helping more families than we ever thought possible from the start of MIB agents. Um, it's just grown so much and the, the need is so great in this community. Um, and what we also have found is that serving patients and families require more than just the love that we have to give um, to accomplish better. So please remember MIB agents in your giving plan. Um, thank you and thanks for listening to me uh, talk about that. Uh, Paul, would you start the introductions please? Sure, thank you, Anne. It's great to be with you and, uh, and I'm really grateful for the invitation and honored to be with the group today and those who are watching live and those who participate uh, some other time. It's great to be with everyone. And I'm joining you from North Florida. Our organization is headquartered in Tallahassee, Florida. And, um, and I, I have to say, I love the name MIB Agents. I love what it means. And, uh, and what we'll talk about today is what families, caregivers, both um, family and friends, and also professional healthcare providers can do for everybody to make it better, make it a little bit better. And we'll unpack how to plan that out. So I'm honored to be with you and, uh, and with our other panelists, Annika and Andrew too. Hi, my name's Annika. I'm uh, currently a nursing student in university and um, my brother Ian had osteosarcoma. So that's like my connection. And um, I'm just excited here to be here today and hear more about this topic, so. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a junior in high school. I was diagnosed about four years ago, but I'm all clear now, um, and I'm happy to be here. I'm again, Andrew. It's great to have you part of this conversation. And uh, as I as as I begin some of my remarks, just to tee us off and tee off our conversation, feel free to chime in uh, and either wave your hand or uh, or just come off of mute and join in the conversation. I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, what I'll do is I'll give you a little bit of a nutshell of our work at Aging with Dignity and the Five Wishes program, which is useful for everyone, I think, and, uh, and, then, and then open it up to questions from any of the panelists and any discussion that we, we know might exist in the chat too, or any other questions that are out there. So, um, so I mentioned your name, uh, Make It Better, and I like how clear that message is, how beautiful that is 
to um, to have a, some some clarity in what your intentions are about. And the same is true, I think, for our organization. I'll tell you a little bit about who we are and, and why we exist, why we were founded, what's kind of baked into the roots of what Aging with Dignity is all about. So as Anne mentioned, our founder, Jim Tui, worked with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. He was Mother Teresa's legal counsel for about 12 years, the last 12 years of her life, actually. <clears throat> and even more important than that, he lived as a live-in volunteer in one of her, home, uh, her homes for people with AIDS. It's called the Gift of Peace in Washington, DC. He was a live-in volunteer there and worked in many of her other homes and missions throughout the world. And, and that's important to know because that's, uh, it's part of who we are. It's baked into our identity because what Aging with Dignity is about and what we'll talk more about five wishes is that it's all about finding out what's important to this individual person, the person who you're with, the, the person who you're providing care for, or what's important to us if we're thinking about leaving a trail for our family and friends and what it means to take good care of us, what would be important for them to know? So we look at that word dignity and, and for a lot of people, dignity means kind of a sense of worth. Am, am I worthy? Am I important? Does somebody care? Does anybody care, right? Does anybody care about what's happening to me right now? And for family members and caregivers and doctors and nurses, oftentimes there's that desire to make sure that the person that we're caring for knows that we honor their human dignity, but we're not sure exactly how to do that. Like, like how does it actually translate into tangible action? That's where five wishes comes in. But before I dig into that, uh, I'll share with you this kind of a, a short story, an example that that connects to my first time visiting Calcutta and interacting with the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa's order that she founded. So this was several years after I started working at Aging with Dignity and I've been part of this work now for over 20 years. I started fresh out of college because my heart attached to the mission of Aging with Dignity. I knew it was important because of my own experience with my parents and my grandparents. And, uh, and so my heart attached to the mission, but after working so long at Aging with Dignity, I really wanted to make this trip to Calcutta. And I wasn't sure exactly what awaited me there. So on the very first day, I went to the, uh, the home for the dying, it's called Kaligat in Calcutta. And I went there and, uh, and one of the sisters put a, um, a plate of food in my hand and pointed me toward a uh, a man who was sitting up in a bed, actually a cot was kind of on the ground. So I went over and I was kind of nervous because I didn't know what exactly I was going to do. And I couldn't speak his language. He spoke Hindi, I spoke English. I could say namaste, but that was about it. And, and so I sat down and I was unsure of what to do. And this man looked at me and he gave me this big smile. A big smile on his face. Uh, I could tell he was very sick. He actually, in fact, I believe had leprosy. And, and so the only thing that I knew to do was to help him eat a little bit of the food that I had. It was the only thing I had to offer. And he just kept looking at me with a big smile. And, uh, and after a few bites of food, he pointed to himself, just kind of tapped himself in the chest. And he said, Asim. And I nodded, I wasn't sure what he was saying. And then he pointed at me, this is like the universal sign language, right? Pointed at me with a kind of a question mark. And then I realized he was asking me my name. So I said, Paul, and then he got a big smile on his face. So I literally sat there on this bed for about an hour, just helping him to eat. And the only thing that we said to each other the entire time was each other's names. So it was a whole hour of, Asim, Paul, Asim, Paul, and smile. And that was the only interaction that we had as far as anything intelligible that we could say to one another. But when I thought back about that, I mean, man, obviously I'm talking about it now, so it's stuck in my mind. The beauty of it, the beauty of just being present together with each other. Uh, I, I'm sure if I hadn't come along, somebody else would have 
helped him with his food. So there wasn't any grand answer or solution that I provided, but it was more about what he provided to me in all honesty. Because when I look back about that, uh, my one regret is that Asim smiled first. He, I was the one there thinking, okay, I'm gonna help somebody. Uh, but really it was Asim who showed me that it was okay. And did that by a simple smile. And once I saw his smile, I was able to return it. And he introduced himself to me by saying his name. And then I introduced myself to him by saying my name. And I only offer that just to show, uh, number one, these small things really do matter a lot. They, they, um, they resonate, they stand out in people's minds. They do endorse the idea that the person is worthy that the person has inherent value, that desire to be present to one another. And also I would say it changes the way now I would interact with someone because now I want to be first to smile. I want to be first to introduce myself and say my name, uh, even if the other person is unsure. So, so that's, that's you know just one little human example of what it means to acknowledge each other's human worth, human dignity, when we're with each other. That was the idea behind Five Wishes when we created it. We thought as a, as a small nonprofit organization that wanted to focus on human dignity, particularly during times of serious illness, particularly if somebody loses the ability to communicate, if they're not able to speak, if they can't even say their name, then, how do we leave a little bit of a trail so that their caregivers, whether it's family or friends or doctors or nurses, so that they know what is important to that person so that they can provide it if it's possible. So that's what the, the, the kind of the motivation behind Five Wishes was. And we thought if it could help a handful of people, that would be great. And we've reached now almost 40 million people all over the world and provided five wishes in 30 different languages. So I'll tell you a little bit about how, how you could use five wishes. And there's also a, a, a newer document, a resource that's called Voicing My Choices that's intended for adolescents and young adults. So it's not only just a legal document, but also a, a, a discussion document that you can use either in place of five wishes or along with five wishes, you can use both if you like, and they both go hand in hand. So as we dig into uh, kind of the thought behind five wishes and some things that you might want to think about or ask your family member about if you're providing care or relate to a family member if you think you may be in need of care. Uh, when people are asked the question, if you are very sick, if there's a chance that you may be near the end of life, what things would be most important to you? Well, these are some of the common answers. A lot of times people say, I wanna be at home. I don't wanna be in pain. I want to have people with me when possible. And I still want to have a say in what decisions are made about me, even if I can't speak for myself. So if I'm not able to communicate, if I'm not able to speak, I still want what's decided about me to be based on what I would have wanted for myself, what I would have decided for myself. And that's what led us to creating Five Wishes, a, a 12 page document that meets the legal requirements for adults. So if you're 18 or over, this meets the legal requirements for an advanced directive, durable power of attorney for healthcare, living will, those things rolled into one. If you're not 18, you can still use Five Wishes. Uh, it's not set up to be a legal document for someone who is not yet 18 and isn't yet an adult. Uh, we'll talk about that specifically when we talk about the details of which one, but it's still a good, a, a good guide and a format that you can use to convey to the people who would be around you, who would be caring for you, kind of the goalposts, the, the flags on the field that say, this is what's important. This is what I'd like. This is what I don't like. Uh, and here's, here's a bit of a map to follow. So we wanted Five Wishes to be simple, easy to understand, written in everyday language so that people could fill it out in their family living room around their dining room table. In other words, you don't have to take it to a lawyer. 
you don't have to have a law degree or a medical degree or a nursing degree to be able to understand it. This is something that is about you. So you are the expert, right? You shouldn't have to go to a different professional to be able to convey to the people who you care about and who care about you to be able to convey to them what's important to you. That was our idea with Five Wishes was that this, this can be a simple process. Even if it's a hard topic to talk about, the process of it can be made simpler and it can focus on peace of mind. And, and also focus on this important issue of helping to avoid kind of the second guessing or guilt or disagreement among family members if they're not sure about what the person would have wanted. And that could be about something like medical treatment, or it could be about something like if the person would rather be at home or would prefer to be at, uh, in a hospital or in a hospice inpatient uh, facility. Those types of things that sometimes, uh, sometimes there are no decisions to make and sometimes there are lots of decisions to make. So the more that we can do to give a little bit of a trail, like a breadcrumb trail of what our goalpost would be, the, help, the more helpful it is. So in the next couple of minutes, I'll drill into the, to each of the five wishes. And they hit on these five items. The first is thinking about who would be your decision maker if you're not able to speak for yourself. The second is giving guidance on the exact types of medical treatment that you'd want or not want. This asks questions about life support treatment. And then the third, fourth, and fifth wishes are really my favorite. And these are the ones that we hear often about from families who have used five wishes. They contact us and they tell us that these are the ones that really were, um, were the most useful and most helpful to them. Thoughts about comfort and who you want to be with you and what you want your loved ones to know. So the first wish, and, um, and remember this, some of these examples are coming directly from Five Wishes and they correspond to uh, similar sections that are in the Voicing My Choices document as well. I'll show you a few, uh, an, an image of that and where you can get it as well. But wish one um, is naming what's called a healthcare agent or a durable power of attorney for healthcare. If you're under 18, then that person is likely your parent or your guardian. So whoever your parent or your guardian is would be the designated decision maker if for even a short amount of time, you're not able to make your own decisions. But if you're today 16 or 17, 18, is not that far away. So you might wanna give some thought to at the age of 18, if you weren't able to speak for yourself, would your parent be the right person to make that decision? For a lot of people that would remain the case. If you're 18, 19, 20, oftentimes that your parent is still the best decision maker. Sometimes not, sometimes it's a close friend. Um, uh, so that's something to give thought to. And also um, if it is a parent, that's good to confirm and to write it in the document, whether it's five wishes or voicing my choices. And, and then give any instruction about how you'd want that person to go about making decisions. You know, sometimes I've seen where people write in and there are blank lines in wish one, and they can write down that they want uh, their parents to, to talk with uh, maybe a friend, to consult with a close friend, or to include them in the decision-making process. If there's somebody who has been walking down this, this path and this journey with you and they've been involved in, in life with you, then um, that might be something to include, that you, a, a direction that you want your parents to include that person in decision making. It might be something that you want to point to a, a, a faith leader, a priest or a rabbi, a minister, if, if you want them to be included in decision making or at least consulted. Those are the things that you might want to add to, uh, to your thoughts about a healthcare agent. And then wish two gets into some specifics about life support treatment, defining all the things that it can be, the types of medical treatment that could be considered life support treatment. And then it poses a couple of questions about if somebody is near the end of life, if they're close to death and life support treatment would only delay the, the, their moment of death, then what would they want? Would they either want to receive life support treatment 
or not receive it, or a third middle ground option that, um, that I'd like it if it's helping my condition and symptoms, but if not, I, I would want it stopped. And these are those choices listed out there. Either a yes, I want it, no, I don't want it, or the third middle ground option of, uh, of I, I wanted it if it could be helpful, but then I'd like it to be stopped. And here's the thing here. When you're making these decisions, if you're filling out the document or if you're just holding the document in your hand, or if you're just getting this information from this session today and using the information to have a conversation with parents or siblings or doctors or nurses, and, and you're talking about life support treatment, there's not really a, a, a magic answer that is going to provide the answer to all scenarios and all situations, right? It's not like you're trying to fill out a grid that has a hundred different scenarios and you're going to give the exact answer for every possible option. That's not what this is. What it is, is giving some kind of basic guidance about your thoughts about life support treatment and how decisions should be made. And, uh, and that's important for your family and your healthcare providers to know because if they ever have to ask themselves that question so that they could answer it on your behalf, then they have that recollection, either in a document or remembering a conversation that you've had where you've expressed some direction, almost like a compass. You're kind of providing a compass to them, somebody who's going to have to walk down a path and, uh, and, and they're, they're going to look to you, they'll want to look to you, or they'll want to do what you would want to have for yourself but they just need something to go on. They need some guidance. That's what this discussion allows you to be able to do and, and write it down in a document. Then, so now we pivot and we're going from the, the legal ideas of who a decision maker is and the clinical ideas about life support treatment to now putting the focus even more squarely on the individual person. What does it mean to you to be comfortable? And if people are caring for you, and this doesn't have to be only near the end of life, this can be in, in any part of the journey of serious illness. But if somebody's caring for you and their desire is to help you to be comfortable physically, to help your body to feel comfortable, what would that look like? What things could they do? So there are items here, what kind of bullet point prompts and the way that this is written out is that anything that you see that you don't want, you just cross it out. So it's all written in the affirmative. Anything that you don't want, you cross it out. You can write in the margins or attach pages if you have different thoughts about what you do want to say. Uh, but it has discussions about pain management. It says, I don't want to be in pain. And I want my doctor to relieve my pain, even if that means that I'll be drowsy or sleep more than I would otherwise. And for some people, that changes the equation a little bit. You know, they, and, and sometimes that answer changes over time. There might be a time where you want to convey or to say that you're willing to be in a little bit of pain if that means that you have more, uh, uh, more time to be present with the people around you. There may be a time where you say that is not the case. For some people, they may think about this and, and think that one of their biggest concerns, one of the big things that they want to avoid is being in any type of physical pain. So that's important to say. Remember, if you're thinking about kind of creating the compass that somebody else will use to walk down this path, you know, that, that's, that's an important mark on that compass to leave that, that uh, indication. So everything from pain management to what some people might think of as the, the little things like a cool moist cloth, a cloth on your head if you have a fever, if you're warm, keeping your mouth moist if you have dryness. I want to be massaged and it has, I wanna be massaged with warm oils. Some people laugh at that. Some people cross out the warm oils. Some people uh, you know, will, will cross the whole thing out. I remember when I was filling this out with, uh, with my mom, she kind of cringed at that. And she said, I went for a massage one time and. I just couldn't stop laughing. I was so ticklish. Like I didn't want somebody touching my shoulders. And I said, well, okay, well, how about, um, my mom always liked to have manicures. So 
I said, well, how about a hand massage? Would you want a hand massage? And she said, oh yeah, a hand massage would be great. So now I know. Uh, and even when it comes to things like warm oils, I, there was, I, I've heard of many people writing in the margins to the exact scents that they like, you know, whether it's lavender or sandalwood or whatever it is, something that the smell evokes a, a positive feeling to them. And on the opposite side, you can imagine if there are smells that you really hate, the last thing that you would want is for somebody to come in and think they're doing something that really helps you and make the room stink, right? <laughs> and, and those are the things that, again, may seem kind of inconsequential and not even worth thinking about. But I think the very fact that these are the things that we hear in the feedback from families when they come back to us and say, this is what made a difference. Because these are the action points, right? These are the things that say, if you want to show this person who you love, if you wanna show them that you love them and that they, they are valuable and that they are meaningful and that they hold their inherent dignity, well, how do you do it? Well, one of the ways you do that is by knowing them, knowing what's important to them, knowing if they like lavender or if they don't like lavender and then involving that in their care. So those are the types of things that you might, you know, you might want to get even more specific on. As I mentioned, you can write it in the margins or you can write pages and attach it to it. And then wish four goes into another pivot and it goes from the physical comfort side to how you want people to treat you. So this is more about relationships and, um, and it, who you'd like to be with you. If there's anybody that you don't want to be there. If you want somebody to hold your hand, if you don't want somebody to hold your hand, if you'd like to have people praying for you or praying with you, if you'd like to have a chaplain visit, if that presumes that you might be in a hospital or maybe a, a visit at, at your home. If you'd like to have pictures of loved ones or friends nearby, that's sometimes something that is, is really meaningful to be able to have both for the, the person, the people who are providing care and the people who are receiving care to, um, to have that visual connection and recognition to people. That was a, that was a very big deal over, over the past year and a half with COVID and COVID restrictions on visitation and healthcare facilities. Goodness, I, I walked that road with some people in my own family and it was really tough not being able to be next to people. And, um, and we did the next best thing. We did the whole routine with video chats and made posters and had pictures and worked with nurses to bring them up to the room and post them. And those things were all imperfect. They weren't what we wanted to do because I wanted to be standing there with, with, with my family. Um, but they were, they were the next best thing, the next right thing that we could do. And it meant a lot. It was really meaningful. Uh, so hopefully we make our way through any of those restrictions and those are more in our past than in our future, because oftentimes that is a desire that people have is to just, just be present with one another and, uh, and to be with people who we love when we are either sick ourselves or when, uh, when someone we love needs care. The last one there, the last bullet point uh, is, a, is actually a rather new addition to Five Wishes and uh, and it makes me think back to my story about Asim because it's a simple statement that says, I wish to be called by name. Please call me. And then there's a blank line. And this is there because sometimes people like, uh, well, you, can, you should be called what you want to be called, right? And, uh, and for some people, they want to be formal and be called Mr. or Dr. So-and-so. Uh, other people prefer informal. Other people have nicknames. Uh, other people have things that they don't want anybody to call them or maybe a nickname they used to be called and they don't want to be called that anymore. Anything like that, uh, it kind of, it doesn't get more personal than your name. So it should be something that should be known and, uh, and you can be called what you want to be called. And the last, the last section of five wishes is, uh, is a section on your wishes for what you want your loved ones to know. And this touches on expressions of love and forgiveness, forgiveness that you want to extend and forgiveness that you might receive. And these, 
these things really get to the heart and I would say the heart and the soul of what we hear from so many people when they say, uh, these are the things that are at the top of my mind that really matter a lot to me. If people are posed that question, if, you, if, you're very, if you're very sick, if you're seriously ill, what are the most important things that you'd want to be able to be certain of or to be able to take care of or to be able to do or to be able to give attention to? And these are the things that often for many people rise to the top of the list of making sure that your family and the people who you love know that you love them. And, uh, and then also thinking about other things that are further down in Wish 5 that aren't on the screen, but are included as prompts about how you want to be remembered and what we would want to happen after we've died if we want to be buried or cremated and who knows those wishes. So, you know, I definitely get that these are, these, these are difficult, challenging topics for people to talk about of any age. And, um, and it's, it can be challenging to think about this if we're thinking about it long into the future or if it's something that is, might be possible in our immediate future not too far down the road. So, um, so, you know, our hope is that five wishes in this framework, it makes it a little bit easier to broach these conversations and to make some of these decisions because we get that it's difficult. We all, anybody who's, anybody who's talked about this knows that it can be a challenge, but it doesn't have to be a challenge because the forms are difficult to understand or because they leave out the things that matter most. And I think that's what's caused Five Wishes to resonate with so many people, is that it, um, it hits at the heart of the things that, that they want to be able to convey and want to be able to express. So a couple of last thoughts before we turn it over to, to questions and conversation and, and other ideas that you might wanna think through. Uh, as you think about talking with loved ones, whether it's family or your close friends, uh, number one, you can use this, this conversation, this webinar as an excuse. You, know, you can say that you participated in this, you gave some thought to what you'd like, and, um, and maybe you've filled out five wishes or voicing my choices, and you can tell them, you know, or ask them, can I talk about this with you? Can I tell you some of the things that are important to me so that you know? And that's oftentimes uh, an easier way to start a conversation rather than putting someone else on the spot, right? Rather than just pointedly asking them what they would want for themselves, sometimes it's easier to start with your own wishes first. And I'd say that no matter, um, no matter what your age is, uh, and that can be parents talking with their uh, children, either adult children or adolescent children, if there is a, a serious illness that requires decisions to be thought about in advance. Uh, the, the thing that we see that's most helpful is that anything that can be done or the way to contextualize the conversation that, that puts us together, that unites us together, whether it's a small group of family or even if it's with a doctor and a patient, if we can convey, here's the deal. <laughs> you're not in this boat alone. We, are, we, we might not all have the same conditions, but we are all in the boat of wanting to take good care of each other. We love each other. We wanna do right by one another. We wanna make the right decisions for one another. Let's make sure we know the best, the best thing and start a conversation that way. Sometimes it's also a, a, a door opener, a conversation starter if you happen to have seen something on a plot on a TV show or a movie, or if there's a family member or family experience or a friend experience that either goes really well or really badly, and you wanna say, hey, you know how that played out for uncle so-and-so? That was really good, or that was terrible. <laughs> Don't let that happen again, or th those types of things. So a point of reference to be able to, um, to jump off from. And then as you think about talking with your doctor, oftentimes, you know, here, here's I think the flag wave on this, uh, on this topic. Doctors often wait for patients to bring up this topic in conversation and patients wait for doctors 
to bring up the questions and the topic. And each one thinks that the other one is going to do it. So my encouragement to you, to everybody, is to take the initiative and introduce it. To say at your next visit, whether it's a, you know, with a primary care provider or specialist, that, um, that you've given some thought to this. And if you've completed a document, like Five Wishes or Voicing My Choices, then you can make a copy and bring it to your doctor and say, can you please put this in my medical chart? And then that way, if you have any questions about your specific condition and what's, you know, the, what's likely to happen next, and if you're thinking specifically about questions and in, in uh, wish two about life support treatment and you want to know, you know how, how does that relate to complications that might exist given your known condition, then your doctor's the perfect person to talk through that with. So, um, so the headline there though is, don't wait for your doctor to bring it up, uh, know that you can bring up the conversation yourself. And lastly, um, on the last slide, the next one, I'll leave you with our website. It's fivewishes.org, five spelled out, fivewishes.org. But there, if you go to the store at fivewishes.org, you can see how you can get copies of Five Wishes for you, for your family. You'll also see uh, this document called Voicing My Choices, which is based on, on Five Wishes. All the items that we just talked about, um, that's in there. It has a little bit of a different look and feel for it. Uh, it's not intended to be a legal document, so it may not meet all the legal requirements in all states like Five Wishes does. So if you're under 18, this might be a good choice for you to use Voicing My Choices. Uh, if you are 18 or over, close to 18, then Five Wishes might be more helpful because it does meet the legal requirements in almost all states. Uh, but both, either or, are very helpful for everyone because it gives you a framework. It gives you something that you can sit down with somebody, flip through a few pages, fill out a document, uh, or at least have something as a guide that guides your conversation so that you're not having to pull all of this out of thin air and reinvent the wheel and think of it yourself. Uh, that's the intention that's behind that. And, uh, and again, that website is Five Wishes dot org. And, um, and in addition, if you look for uh, and on the five wishes website, or if you just Google five wishes or voicing my choices, and uh, Tara's story, I might even share this afterward with uh, with MIB agents as a as a link to share. There's a video of a, a woman in her 20s who, um, who used voicing my choices and five wishes. And, and just tells a story within a few minutes of how she navigated that discussion with her family and with her doctor. It's a beautiful story, Tara's story of voicing my choices. So with that, I think I'll, I will uh, wrap up my remarks and turn it back over to our, our expert panelists. <laughs> um, thank you. This is, it's so valuable. It's, Gosh, it's it's such a valuable resource. We we found out about this through a friend of MIB, Lori Weiner at the NIH, um, because I happened to be in a situation where I knew um, a young adult who was who was um, dying, and I needed a way to help. And and while the family originally asked for something like this when it came to the, you know, the moment where I, I was to ha physically handling, handing it over, they couldn't do it. Like they couldn't, they didn't want to have that conversation. They just wanted to, you know, have that space be kind of what it was. Um, that's really difficult. That's a really difficult space to be in. And I mean, for me, like, okay, difficult for me, boo-hoo, like it's not your child, you know, it wasn't my child dying. Um, so I'm not, I'm not trying to say oh, it was so hard for me, but what I am saying is it's, it's hard for the parent or the caregiver to accept that and then go walk over to 
the bed that the child's in and go, okay, you know, page, page one, we've, we've, you know, I I really want to know how you're feeling about this. And, and, you know, at the same time, trying to find space in between people visiting and gosh, and you're, so the, the conversation starters were really helpful. And it was my top question. Like, how do we, how do we do this better? And, and how we've talked about this particular session on social media and to people that we know is to say, you know, okay, yes, it's for kids and families dealing with osteosarcoma, um, but it's really for humans. Like (laughs) two things for sure, right? Death and taxes, like this is gonna happen to you. Why not fill this thing out and, and give your family a break by letting them know what you want. It's, it's supernaturally helpful. At the same time, <laughs> I have this document. And I remember when I was first diagnosed going to, to Sun Kettering and right on arrival, you know, okay, you know, your ID, your insurance card, um, your billing information, and then here's advanced planning. And I was like, nope, no, thank you. I'm going to beat this. I don't need that. I don't even want to think about that aspect. Like I, uh, thank you. No, thank you. Don't ever show that to me again. So while I know how important this is and I, I feel it, I know how important this is at the same time, I get the patient and the patient family going, I can't, I just can't do this right now. So I don't know. I do. I, I, I'm just saying that, like I say, you know, this this is uncomfortable. And if you if you need a pass on the conversation, take the pass on the conversation. But uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I don't know how to pass that with somebody else. And honestly, I don't know how to get past it with myself. Maybe I'm not filling it out because I go, oh, my my thoughts and feelings will change on who I want and who I don't want. That's right. And they, and, and they might, and they probably will over time. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we, we share, it sounds like both share admiration for Lori Weiner at NIH. She is Absolutely. fantastic. And, um, and, and she was the motivation behind voicing my choices. This was, uh, this was the, the fruit of her work and the work of her colleagues there. So she does, anything she does is wonderful yeah. and service to great, to great service to people. I think everything that you said is right about how hard this conversation is to have and to start. And, and it can be especially difficult when you're right in the middle of something, like you mentioned when you were walking into the hospital. And for all the good intentions that are there in American healthcare, that's often when people encounter advanced care planning is when they're at the admissions desk of a hospital because hospitals are required to ask the question, yeah. do you have an advanced directive? And if not, do you want one? Not all doctors are required to ask that, but all hospitals are required to ask that. So uh, for anybody who has been with somebody or if you've been admitted to a hospital, there's lots of paperwork to sign. Sometimes now it's all digital, so it might be on an iPad and somebody comes to your room and it's all on the iPad and they scroll through things and how many times you initial your name or sign things, that's not going to be the best time to have a really meaningful conversation about most important things in your life, right? Yeah, Yeah, you're (laughs) gonna make me better, right? You're gonna cure me or not. That's right, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, So the way to really take control of this, to take charge of it, to make sure that that doesn't happen to you or to somebody who you love is as as much as it's not the conversation that's probably at the top of your list to do this week or this month or today, it's it's far easier to talk about it when you're not in the midst of that kind of crisis. When When the decisions might be a little abstract, even if it's thinking about a possibility of something a month from now or a year from now or however long, if the more removed it could be from a moment of crisis, the exact time of crisis is very helpful. Because in a moment of crisis, that's not the time to think through all of these questions. So the reality is 
the people who are faced with making decisions will do the best that they can. Right. And they might have to do the best that they can without any information from you. And sometimes they'll get that right. And sometimes they'll get it wrong. And sometimes the family will all agree on the right thing to do. And sometimes the family will disagree. And those are the reasons that that is the motivation for, um, for kind of for taking that initiative and talking about this before you really need it. And, and what we've known and heard with Voicing My Choices especially is that for young people, oftentimes the, um, one of the biggest barriers is having the permission to be able to express some of these questions in your own mind. Yeah. To be able to say, I might be something that's been in your mind that you've been wondering about and you have questions or you might not have questions because you have answers that you want people to know. And to be able to say, I actually have thought about this and here's what I think is important for you to know, but without the, the kind of the context or the, the excuse to bring up that conversation, yeah. there's not a natural time that it happens. So, so in that way, what we've heard from families, from parents, from doctors and nurses is that when it comes to voicing my choices, it's often the young person who becomes the leader of that conversation. They take it, they personalize it. Uh, it's something that's in, in their court and on their turf. And yeah. that's the idea behind five wishes is to put this, put this on your court and in your turf so that you feel that this is, you are empowered to make these decisions and you should be able to do it in a way that's comfortable for you. And, uh, and that doesn't rely on other people starting the conversation or asking the questions, yeah. but that lets you say, here's the important stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, a crisis is the worst possible time probably to, to start thinking about this. Andrew and, and Annika, any, anything from you on this? I don't have any questions. I just think it's a really, I've never heard about this before, but I think it's a really good document, especially for like um, adolescents and like children and stuff. Like I like how simple the questions are, but they hit all like the major points. And I agree, like most, I feel like most doctors or surgeons like don't want to talk about this. Like they'll just kind of want to glaze over it or not talk about it because their job is to try to make you better. So they don't want to see it that way. But um, I think it's a good conversation to have and not in a hospital, obviously, not like at a time. So, yeah, you were talking about how like some, uh, you know, your requirements fit some of the requirements of states. Are you guys mainly just in the U.S. or are you guys international? Because I know you were talking about how you were over in Calcutta. So I wanted to know that. Yeah, so we we provide five wishes all over the United States and Five Wishes meets the legal requirements in 46 states. So there are four states that have uh, what we would call mandatory form requirements. So you have to use the advanced directive in that state. And those are just uh, New Hampshire, Ohio, Texas, and, uh, and Kansas are the, the, the last of the few to join. But we, prov we will send Five Wishes anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Most other countries outside the United States don't have laws that, that govern these types of decisions. So in the absence of laws that, that govern it, then in most cases, it's just good clinical practice, good medical practice to be able to know what's important to the patient and to honor their choices and honor their decisions. So because of that, it can be used anywhere in the world and we have it available in 30 different languages. So I know in, in India, it is used in some places in Hindi and Bengali and Gujarati and Urdu and, uh, and in other parts of the world too. So that's been, that's been kind of neat to see that grow organically. It's not something that we've tried to um, cultivate. We don't have offices in other parts of the world, but it's just people hearing about it and saying, oh, that sounds like it could be helpful to us. And then we'll send it anywhere. Thank you. As difficult as this conversation is, the book, The Voicing My Choices in particular, which we didn't see the pages from that, but we actually, by the way, have this at MIB and we, there's, we don't charge for anything at MIB agents. Any of our resources, our programs, education material, any of it, it's, it's all free, um, including 
the voicing my choices the voicing my choices is so brilliant it's it actually reminded me of you know when you're did you ever have that um that dr seuss my book about me and it's like mm -hmm. it's like i'm i'm four foot one inch tall i weigh this i live in the mountains i live in the beach and it's like it's so it's not it's certainly not whimsical but it's that kind of simple and it's that clear um i want my clothes to go to kind of you know it, i mean it's it's so simple and it it kind of takes you on a journey from here's the really simple things and here's you know as it goes on it gets a little bit more more complicated what i wanted to say about that specifically is as difficult as it is the the book makes it easy as it can possibly be and post many families have shared with us at MIB pages that their child wrote or that their young adult wrote and it is astonishing the grace that the kids have in this these are my wishes and it's it's um a, you know a sense of generosity and and courage and uh it, god it's it's um god, I don't, beauty from ashes it's it's a it's tragic beauty i don't know there's so many it's, a, it's just a dichotomy or a you know opposites in but the same thing a beautiful agony it's it's really something so it's as hard as it is to have it's a beautiful thing to have after one because you know and you have comfort in what you're doing with the things and with the practice of of celebrating their life and um i you know i i think the more specific someone can be and we were talking about this before and i'm not going to talk about it again because i'll start crying again but <gasps> i'm not crying again but like i want people to wear this at my service i want i want there to be beer you know, like, you know, really silly things give people comfort in that end of life. And it also takes the burden off of the person who's already heavily burdened with grief. It really helps that person to do right by you, which is the whole, that's the gig, right? That's a funeral. That's the gig. You got to do right by that person. You have to do the things that matter to them you know, if they were a low key kind of kind of person, you don't want to, you don't want people showing up in black tie and ball gowns, right? But if they were, you know, if that's, it's, these things are important and it, and it really makes it easier for the living in a time that could not be more difficult. It's something that really makes it easier. So, um, you know, I don't have the answers on how to, how to get this into more people's hands and encourage your child to simultaneously fill this out and continue to have hope that all will be well. I, I don't know how to do that. I don't even know how to do that for myself. Like I, I haven't filled it out. <laughs> I haven't filled it out and I know how important it is. And I want it to be easy for the people that I hopefully in the future, you know, way in the future leave behind. But you know, it's a difficult thing and I don't envy anybody who's in this space that has to do this, but gosh, I encourage you to do it and just, just do it. Just, just get it. It's, it's no charge or you can, you can download it as well and, and fill it out. Um, and the, the, the last thing I'll say about that is we, we have a, a family that's dear to us that at MIB um, and their child did not have this document, but left their wishes on a phone. And I, the, the relief, I'm going to say, the relief, the, the um, gratitude that the family had for finding that on their daughter's phone and to, and to know that, I, I mean, it was just this thing of grace and beauty again, where, where this young woman said, I want my my clothes to go to a women's shelter. Uh, I want my, you know, I want my um, this and that to go to uh, these really well thought out charities um, and, and friends even. And so even if you think your child's not thinking about this, they're thinking about this and it gives them a way to really express 
what they want. And in turn, it's going to give you some peace. And I, I just, I can't say, I can't say enough about it. I just wish that we, we had a way to deliver it in a way that was more gentle or without taking away hope. Because I also understand why doctors don't go, okay, I'm gonna send you home with this book, please fill this out and it's gonna give you peace. Because the, the patient family goes, well, my doctor's giving up on us. And that's that's not the case. There's the, anyway, it's it's really tough. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I just, I'm so grateful for this resource and I, I, I hope people download it or, or email us and ask us for it or go to the website, whatever, whatever suits you. Um, it's, it's an important thing. Yeah. I love the image that you painted of the, the goodness and the grace and the beauty that can exist in the, in the midst of mess of trial of challenge, because that is true. And it is possible that those things coexist. And um, and too often, uh, especially our, our the, the, when we're in the midst of healthcare systems and process, the space for that goodness and beauty sometimes gets pushed out. And these conversations, if you can have them with a the family and have them with your healthcare providers, it makes room for that grace and the goodness and the beauty to exist in the way that you envision it, in the way that you see it. And, uh, and I think MIB Agents is doing exactly the right thing to spread the word about this and making it available and, ex and, and in telling the stories as you just did. I think that is the inspiration that, that people, when they hear it, hopefully when you hear it today, you're inspired by it. And, and it's wonderful that MIB is providing it, Voicing My Choices at no cost. So I hope everybody who can use it reaches out and contacts you and gets it and shares it with their family. Right. Um, it just had a quick question here. The name of the book for a child under the age of 18 is Voicing My Choices. And again, you can, you can email us at info at mibagents.org. Uh, go to our website. You can PM me on Facebook. Uh, um, email me, and at mibagents.org, and, and we'll get that resource out to you. Um, and of course, you know, connect with us on, on any question whatsoever, but uh, we'll also send this final um, version of this video and podcast. We'll email it, we'll email the links and everything you need to know, um, everything that we've talked about here will be on that as well. So, so not to worry if you don't have a pen handy, we'll, we'll sort you out. Um, Okay, our time's up. Any anything else to to say? Add. All good. Did we say it all? <laughs> and and we said it all without me crying. So that was, <laughs> that was it's a gold star. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you so much again, Paul. This um, is just uh, just a, such a valuable resource that that makes it better by making it easier to have a difficult, impart difficult information and share difficult, um, difficult things in a difficult time. And thank you. Um, and to you and your colleagues and, and Mother Teresa, talking about a gold star, we'll just do another gold star for gold, <laughs> for Mother <laughs> Teresa. She's a Very boss. True. Well, it's good <laughs> for, our, for our organizations to be able to participate in each other's mission. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that and grateful for the invitation. Oh, so grateful. So um, again, this is this will be ready pretty soon on YouTube, mibagents.org, wherever you get your podcast. Um, and if you registered, we'll be sending it off to you shortly. Um, also wanted to tell you that coming up on Osteobytes uh, through the rest of the year, we have some really cool sessions coming up. We have, uh, we have one on rotation plasty where the surgeon is gonna present about rotation plasty and what's that like uh, simultaneously with a patient who has rotation plasty. And uh, that's coming up. We also have a osteo osteosarcoma clinical trial coming up, which is very exciting. It's gonna be uh, debuting on osteobites. Um, and then a really uh, cool session coming up that Annika is a part of. It's called uh, Talking Osteosarcoma Like No One Is Watching. 
If I were a parent with a child with osteosarcoma, I would definitely want to tune into this. And if I was a kid with osteosarcoma or a young adult, I would definitely want to be in on this. We're just going to be talking about osteosarcoma and what we, you know, what about it? Like how much we, how much we hate it, what it taught us, what's, what's, you know, how do we feel about it? How do we feel about our parents? All of that kind of stuff. Um, so make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter and follow us on social media so you get all the intel on that and other sessions coming up and all the uh, MIB good good stuff. Um, until then, thanks again, Paul, for sharing such important information with us today. And um, thank you as always and forever to our junior board members who are awesome, um, Annika and Andrew. Thanks, you guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Like and share, and if you like this video, then check out some more on our YouTube channel.